Praise God. Welcome to um, So what's happening? Praise God. Welcome to another edition of um, Ignition today. Um, I'm quite happy and glad that you were able to join us uh, for such a good time. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce um, my uh, book, the compilation of um, my liquid blog. I think this was um, uh, presented about two and a half years ago when I was celebrating one of my bad days. I'm not going to tell you how old I was then, but um, it's a good thing. Uh, I would encourage you, if you can uh, send me your address privately through my Twitter handle, FBI Mind Jane, uh, I'll be glad to send you a copy post free. That's that, but I'm sure you will be blessed. I'll come, let's do what we are here to do tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to answer some nagging questions that come with grace. You'll know over the last, um, say, seven to eight weeks, I've been teaching on Colossians and with the, and the book of Galatians. And like I have stressed, the book of Galatians is actually uh, concentrating on grace, uh, the unmerited, undeserved favor of God, which you cannot earn. Um, the, the favor of God that comes with what Christ did. Uh, which you can only access through faith. And that's what we're going to, uh, that's what we did for over the last eight weeks. Now, if you properly understand grace, and if you properly understand the fact that uh, the law is no longer relevant to us right now, certain legitimate questions must come to your heart. Definitely. Uh, if grace has been well taught, or and if you uh, properly understood it, some questions must definitely come to your heart. And I call them the nagging questions that comes with grace. Uh, I need to make a confession here. What I'm about to teach you tonight actually took me about 15 years uh, to uh, get into a place of understanding uh, right now. So uh, I'll encourage you that after this session, please go back and check all the scriptures that we looked at and the explanation I've given, uh, meditate on them. Like I always tell people, uh, grace is something that has to come to you by revelation. After you've meditated, it, you meditated on it for some time, then God will reveal uh, it will, it will begin to dawn in your heart like a big star. Because there's no analogy, there's no comparison uh, for for grace. That's why you have to spend time and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and uh, open it up for you. Uh, I can understand the Galatians going back to law after a period of time. Uh, you can't say you understood grace and that's all. It's something that you must uh, make sure it becomes a concept by which you live in. And it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. But the more you understand it, the more you find out that uh, you walk in the liberty. We are in Christ, set you free. Hallelujah. Christianity then becomes uh, an interesting experience. Uh, life becomes more enjoyable as a Christian. Hallelujah. So I say today, there are three nagging questions, probably four, but let's deal with three. The first question anybody who has come to understand grace would ask is that if the law of Moses was never God's primary intention, it was never God's best, and it was temporary, and it has passed away, just like Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13 um, uh, says. Why 
will God institute grace? That's the first question. And when this one is properly taught and properly understood, the next question that will come to your heart is that if with the passing of the law, sin is no longer relevant with God uh, for those who are born again, uh, you must then ask yourself, is grace encouraging sin? So these two questions, uh, Paul in his epistles answered saying that, God forbid, certainly not. Grace is not encouraging sin. And actually uh, the law was not even, um, there was nothing wrong with the law. It was the people who were supposed to fulfill the law that had the problem. And uh, the last question is, if we say by nobody will be justified before God by self-effort or by the law, if we say God does not need your self-effort, that you have to enter grace by faith, is God encouraging laziness? To that too, I see God forbid. Hallelujah. But we'll take it one after the other. And one will move we we'll move from one to the other so that you can understand. I will try and go um, a, a bit slowly so that you, you can follow me. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, a few scriptures to throw light into uh, the, the argument and the answer. And what I intend to do is use two versions so that you can understand I personally prefer the KJV, but I know a lot of people prefer the uh, New Living Translation. So we'll be comparing what both say. Now, to answer the first question, what was the purpose of the law? Why did God bring the law? For about 3,000 years, men lived without the law. And the law lasted over just about a thousand years. And since Christ came and died, the law is no longer in effect. So why did God instituted the law? Now, let's look at certain scriptures that will lay the foundation so that you can understand. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 5. I want you to look at this piece of scripture and we will spend time exegizing the scripture so that you can understand. Romans chapter 5, let's look at it from verse 12. It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there's no law. The word imputed means it's not reckoned to your account. So, what the scripture is saying that before the law, despite before God instituted the law, the sin was in the world. But because there was no law, God did not reckon it into people's account. Praise the Lord. Let's look at it in um, the New Living Translation so that you, you get a whiff of it. Um, verse 12 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. And Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. That is, the sin of um, Adam and Eve spread through. Now look at verse 13. It says, yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Praise the Lord. So that's why the fact that sin was in the world, because there was no law to break, 
God did not impute this sin into people's account. So I want you to hold on to that. Look at Romans chapter uh, 4. Let's look at Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 15. Romans chapter 4, verse 15. And see what Romans chapter 4, verse uh, 15 says. Don't forget that we started by saying, that's why the fact that sin was in the world, God did not impute the sin into people's account because there was no law to break yet. Okay, now, Romans chapter 4, verse um, 15 says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, So, sorry, um, Bastos says, because the law walketh right, for where no law is, there is no transgression. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, for the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. King James Russell says that for where no law is, there is no transgression. So you need the law. And when you break the law, that is transgression. Then sin is imputed into your account. The equation is this. Law, transgression or breaking of that law, then sin is then added to your account. However, if there is no law, you cannot transgress it, you cannot break a law that does not exist. So that's why the fact that the sin is there, it cannot be imputed into your account. That is what Romans chapter 5 verse 13 is saying. That until the law, sin was in the world. But sin was not imputed into people's account. So when the law came, then there was opportunity to transgress that law. And because there was opportunity to transgress or break that law or to be disobedient to that law, it then gave sin an opportunity to be imputed into people's account. Let me give you a, 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 a good example. The, after, the, the, after the fall of Abraham, of Adam, you know the, 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 the first child came, killed his brother. But because there was no law, the man who committed murder, God protected him. God said nobody is allowed to kill him. However, when the law came, the first man that broke the first law, which was, um, you must observe the fact, um, uh, Sabbath day, because he has transgressed that law, the consequence was that he should be stoned to death. Can you, can you, can you see, can you see that? So the reason why, um, see why the law came, the law came because we needed the law to introduce transgression so that sin can then be imputed into people's account. When God gave the law through Moses, people thought it was a good thing. Actually, it was... Um, the, the law was perfect, but they were not, these people were not perfect. So of necessity, they had to break that law, they had to transgress that law, so that sin then can be imputed into the account. Thank God that God provided sacrifice for every transgression and sin, and also provided uh, something that is on the day of atonement to cleanse any residue. So can you see that equation? In fact, that equation is even longer than that. It's the law, then transgression, that is the breaking of that law, then sin, then sin will then lead to death. So you, 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 you can, so it came, the law came so that there can be transgression, so that 
with transgression, then legitimately sin can be imputed into people's account. So the question is, why would God do that? Why would why would why would, why would, why would God do that? There are several reasons. Because you will find that between the fall and in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 6, you will find that, that men became so perverse that it was so bad that God decided that he had to wipe the world away with flood. Because there was no remedy. And God only spared about eight people. And after the flood, God said he was not going to wipe away the world again with flood. So, but there was nothing to stop people. So they kept on sinning. They kept on, they kept on sinning. And sin became something acceptable. People just kept on doing whatever they liked. God would intervene at intervals, for instance, with Sodom and Gomorrah. God had to completely wipe up um, uh, a, a whole city. Because there was no remedy. Christ had not come. So one of the reasons why God introduced the law is to show people his standard. You know, uh, People were in self-deception. And gradually sin was entering um, into their heart. And it was in some section, God needed to show what his own standard is. So that they will have a reckoning. That's, that, that's the first reason. Now, people were living a, uh, they, they, they were comparing themselves with themselves and measuring themselves by themselves. I thinking uh, that is the standard of God. For instance, in um, Genesis chapter, I think Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse um, uh, 23, there was a guy called Lamech. This guy, guy to have a two, to, to, that the Bible record, recorded has two wives. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 23, Lamech was telling his two wives, he said, listen, I have killed a man who wanted to kill me? I've killed a man who has wounded me. That if God protected Cain, then God would have to protect me several times. What Lamech did not know was that God did not approve of the killing of Cain. So he was comparing himself uh, with himself, just like Paul said in First Corinthians chapter ten, verse. Uh, 12, that those who measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves by themselves, they are not wise. Then, the other point, why God needed to introduce the law so that translation can be obvious, is that people thought they were above sin. They didn't know that actually their nature was sinful itself. So, the law had to come to expose to them that they had a, a sinful nature. Let me give you an example. You can have a pig, and um, you bring the pig into the house, and you wash that pig, and the pig becomes uh, clean, and you tie a ribbon on the head of that pig, and the pig is so so happy. The, the pig the, is honking all over the, the house, it's quite happy, it's clean. But you have not changed the nature of that pig. The pig is a deception. All you need to do is to show that pig a mock, and it will roll in that mock and realize that, ah, I'm still a pig. Or if you have a mean bull that is chasing and charging everybody, and all of a sudden this mean bull wants by itself to say, ah, I'm now a gentleman. I'm not going to charge anybody. I'm just going to eat. Uh, grass. All you need to do is bring a rag, a red rag, before that bull, and you start charging them. You will realize that his nature has not changed. God had to introduce the law to show them his own standard. So, by showing them his own standard, they had to realize that this standard of God is so high, they cannot meet up with it. Praise the Lord.
So the law exposed sin in man. He exposed the sinful nature of man. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Romans chapter 7, verse uh, 7 to 9. Let's look at Romans chapter 7, verse 7 to 9, because it's actually um, uh, quite, quite useful for you to look at this um, scripture. So, Romans chapter 7, let's look at verse 7 to 9. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. It wasn't the law that had problems, it was the people. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I have not known laws, except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. That the sin was dormant in me without the law. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment or the law came, sin revived and... I died. Let's read it in um, the New Living Translation. Well then, am I suggesting the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. So they didn't know that they had sin within their body. When the law came and they saw the standard of God, they now realized, oh my goodness, that their nature already was a sinful nature. I would never have known that coveting is wrong. That is, they would have been coveting and not know that it's wrong. If the law had not said you must not covet. But sin used this commandment to arouse all kind of covetous desire within me. If there was, if there were no law, sin would not have had that power. At one time I lived without understanding the law. But when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life. So the law exposed their nature. He exposed the fact that they were already defeated by sin. The law exposed the fact that they shouldn't be comparing themselves with themselves. God does not judge on a relative justice. If you fulfill all the law and you fail the one, you fail in all, because God is perfect. So God needed to show them that. Are you getting why? And God could only show that by bringing the law so that there will be transgression when they break the law, then the sin will be obvious to them. The law strengthens sin, according to um, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, I think, verse, um, verse uh, 53 or 50, uh, 56. Paul said, the sting of death uh, is sin, and the strength of the law, uh, and, the strength, and the strength of sin is the law. So, the law strengthens sin. It makes sin exceedingly sinful, according to Romans chapter 7, um, uh, verse, verse 13. So you are seeing, so God had to introduce the law to these people so that they can't see. But let me show you one thing. Uh, before then, they didn't know what transgression was. And God had to introduce to them that there's something called transgression. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 21, uh, verse 23. Exodus chapter, no, verse chapter 23. From verse 20. Exodus chapter 23. From verse 20. I, I hope you, you are tracking with me. This was after God, after they, 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 they left Egypt and God had given them um, the Ten Commandments. God now says in verse 20 of Exodus chapter 23, Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in thy in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. That is, this angel will lead you to where I have prepared. Look at verse um, verse 21. 
Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name is in him. They are not, they, they, they not had that word translation before. They have not known anything about breaking the law before. So God is telling them that now, if you have given you the law, if you break it, that is called transgression, and this angel will deal with you. Sin will be imputed into your into your account. Let's read it in New Living Translation. So, New Living Translation, um, Exodus chapter 23 from verse 20. See, I am sending an angel before you to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Pay close attention to him and obey his instruction. Do not rebel against him. For he is my representative, and he will not forgive your rebellion. So, God introduced something new into their lexicon. They now know that there's not a uh, transgression. So, it's a wake up call. And the Lord did all those other things that I've ex um, um, ex explained, explained to you. So sin became exposed, it strengthened them, they knew they were defeated. The purpose of all this is that to bring them to a place that they will know that they cannot save themselves, that their standard is low, that they need a savior. That is why they need a sacrifice, a temporary sacrifice for every sin. That sacrifice acted like their temporary savior. Taking care of that sin and that of the Day of Atonement. Let's look at another scripture. Let's go to Galatians chapter um, 3. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to look at um, this scripture. Look at verse 19. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Says, Wherefore then, wherefore then serveth the law? That is what so was the purpose of the law. It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Making reference to the angel that God mentioned in Exodus chapter 23, verse 20 to 21. So it was introduced because of transgression. Now, why did God now did that? What is the conclusion of that? Why did God have to introduce this law? Now, the, the first reason they are they are they are there's actually one primary reason why God did it um, yeah, is so that they can be kept under check, so that the whole world uh, will not be pervaded by iniquity, by sin, so that something would be there to keep them under check. And that was what you we, we, we read uh, when we studied um, uh, the, the, the book of Galatians. Let's look at Galatians chapter 4, in, uh, chapter 3 again. Let's take it for, from from verse 23. But before faith came, that is before Christ came and we could put faith in what he did, we were kept under the law, shut up into the faith which was afterward uh, be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So, the law served a purpose until Christ came. For instance, if they had not been the law uh, that they could uh, transgress and sin to keep them in, uh, in, in, um, in place, what would have happened was that there would have been so much that, in fact, they might not have even been the virgin for Christ to come through. So, that was the primary purpose of the law. The law kept them in check. 
was like a schoolmaster telling them, you should not do this, you should not do that, you should not do it. It's like when you're in secondary school, they tell you when to wake, when to sleep, when to eat, when to do whatever, when to go to class, when to do prep. But after you, you've left school, you are supposed to be mature enough to know when to sleep, when to go to bed, when to um, wake up. Or when you have um, uh, uh, a child, you tell your child, before you cross the road, you look left, you look right. And if you come from the place where I come from, if you don't do it, your mom will pull you to one side, expose your bum, and then um, give you right hand of uh, fellowship. But, so, once you know that, when you are going to cross the road, you will look left, you will look right. Not because you are afraid that car will kill you, but you will remember what your mom will do to you if you don't do that. But now that you are mature, you are no longer under the fear of, more, of your mom, but you look right and you look left because you've now known what is right to do. So nobody needs to tell you that anymore. Praise the Lord. That is why Romans chapter 10 verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for all those that believe. You are no longer under a schoolmaster. But there's a correct day need for law. Let's look at um, the second reason. First Timothy, look at First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, let's look at it from verse 8. He says, But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. So there's a correct need for for the use of the law. But how do you use the law? Now, in verse 9, knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man, that is you and I, who have the righteousness of uh, uh, God in Christ Jesus, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of father and murderers of mothers, for mostly as on and on. It's not meant for the righteous man, it's meant for the ungodly, for people who don't know Christ. So, even right now, you people who don't know Christ, who think, who are saying, oh, I'm a God to myself, I, I, am, uh, I know the right thing to do. You show that, that person, you show the person that the Bible says that uh, the, the fool says in his heart that there's no God. You, you show them the standard of God. All of us, it was because we saw the standard of God and we realize that we cannot save ourselves. And that is when we gave our life to Christ. And as soon as we gave our life to Christ, the schoolmaster goes back. Huh? And we are no longer under the schoolmaster. We now put faith in what Christ has done. So you can use it to bring people to Christ. But once you you used to bring people to, to, to Christ, the law has no need for those people. Once any man becomes born again, he becomes a new creature. All things are past, they will be old. All things have become new. So you can see the purpose of the law now. And like I, let me just repeat this before we move on. The law itself it's not bad. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's the standard of God. But man in himself cannot meet that standard. You need to put your faith in a Savior and receive it by grace. That's why Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says that and being justified by faith, eh, we have peace with God. And we have access to this grace by faith. Praise the Lord. So that is the purpose of the law. That is why God brought the law. That was why the law was active for about a thousand years, to keep people in check until the promise came, until Christ came. So when you understand this properly, 
The next question you then ask yourself is does sin not matter at all? Does it mean we can just do anything? Let's look at um, uh, Romans chapter 5. All these questions are questions that always come up any time Paul taught about uh, um, Greece. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 and I want us to uh, look at them um, from verse 19. Remember that the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. Uh, it's just for reference. Purpose. So we are going to read uh, from uh, um, Romans chapter 5 verse 19. We're going to read it through to chapters, chapter 6. It says, for us by one man, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That is the the disobedience of um, uh, uh, our friend uh, Adam. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That is by the obedience of Christ shall many be made righteous. So as you became sinner, not because of what you did, uh, you have become righteous not because of what you did. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That's what we've been saying. The law came so that they all, so, so, so that the, 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 the sin might, might become obvious. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That is, the price that was paid eh, is higher eh, than, um, than, than the sin. Verse um, 20, 21, that as sin had reigned unto death, even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's look at the New Living Translation. Because one man dis disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one man, one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. So it is not, you were not the one that said that you became sinner. You are not the one that fulfilled the law eh? to become righteous. But God, but God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all, all people, and brought them to death. Now, God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6. Paul then asks a question. If we say um, uh, sin cannot trump us, there's so much grace. The, the next question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? Of course, the answer is in verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer daring? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted, repeated the same thing, together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Repeated it again. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Paul is saying you need, let me even first say this. If you, if you think grace encourages sin, then I doubt whether you are properly born again. You must know that. So Paul is saying the way to go about it is that you must know that your old sinful self has gone. The point is you now must know your new, your, your new identity in Christ. It's by knowing your new identity in Christ 
that you will then be able to walk before well, um, uh, 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 in, in that light. James chapter 1 verse 24 says that whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, he not being a forgetful hearer of the word, but a doer of the works, a man shall be blessed indeed. You need to continually, you, you need to then school your mind to know what your new identity is. Romans chapter 12, I think verse 2, says that you should not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What By renewing your mind, you are coming to understand who you are in the, the, the new you. It just, just, it just not, it doesn't come like that. You need to understand your identity in Christ. Paul now says that once you understand your identity in Christ, you should then walk according to that man. In Galatians chapter 5, verse, um, verse, uh, verse 16, says that walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The problem is that a lot of Christians... Instead of walking in the spirit, they walk after the flesh. They are still carnal. So, Paul says that once you begin to know your new identity, naturally, since sin becomes distasteful, you, you know it is out of step with who you are now. So, that is the, 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 the first reason why grace does not lead to sin. If you, if you probably understand, Probably understand. Second uh, Corinthians chapter three verse eighteen says that we all beholding as in a mirror eh? the spirit of the Lord. We are changed from one glory to another. But you must look into the perfect law of liberty so that you can see who you are now. You must become acquainted with who you are in the spirit now. The new man. The old one has been crucified. With the body of sin. Secondly, the reason why you must not get involved with sin is that sin hardens your heart. Hebrews chapter uh, chapter three verse thirteen says that their hearts became hardened by this this, this sinfulness of sin. If you continue intentionally sinning, your heart become hardened. God will love you, but you will not love God. You will not have confidence towards God. Because you, 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 you know you are not walking you, according to your new man. You will become like a schizophrenic person. So, it will harden your heart. You will not be able to move in faith. You remember when Christ went to Nazareth and he could not do many uh, mighty works. The Bible said the hearts were hardened because of unbelief. So that's the second reason why you must not sin. God still loves you unconditionally, but you will not love God. The third reason is that you the third reason you will find it in the first John chapter 3 from verse 2 to, to verse 3. That it says um, we, we have not seen him, but we will know exactly who, who, who we are when we see him. And those who have this hope in them purify themselves. If you know that you are like Christ, First John chapter 4, 4, verse 17, as he is, so are we in this world. What you will do is that you will live a more Christ-like life. That's what grace does. First Timothy, uh, uh, Timothy chapter one, uh, verse, um, verse, verse, I think verse ten. Let's look at Timothy chapter one. I hope you 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 are, you are follow you are following me. See, no, actually, Timothy chapter two. Verse, um, verse 11 says that for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. What does grace do? Verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly loss, 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Actually, when you understand grace properly, hmm, holiness will be a fruit. Let me put it this way. The reason why people sin is because they think there's a better alternative than what God has for them. If you know that God has given you the best and he loves you the best, there's no way anything else can entice you. You cannot go into sin. Or you, 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 sin will not be as attractive. The reason why Eve took that um, uh, the, the, the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is because the devil convinced her that there was something better outside what God had given, given them. Once you understand grace properly and you know that there was nothing better than what you have, actually you, you have the best, you will not be enticed by sin. You will not even consider it. Grace teaches us to live a holy and godly life. And you will do it effortlessly if you understand grace. It will not be a struggle. Because you are not living it through your power, you are living it through Christ that lives in you. Because you have now understood the, your, your right identity. Praise the Lord. So, that's what grace does. The, the, the fourth reason is that, eh? well, I mean, that's, the, that's the fourth reason. The fifth reason is that, and this is so dangerous that I need to explain it properly. Now, sin has both a vertical effect and horizontal effect. God loves you unconditionally, but if you are, if you continue sinning, He gives the devil an opportunity against you. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Knowing this, chapter 6, verse 16. Let's start from verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Verse 16 now says, Know ye not to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey. Is servant ye are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. New Living Translation. Well then, since God, God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Verse 16. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteousness. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, to be carnally minded is death. And to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, even though you are born again, if you, you don't know that sin gives you an, ent gives an entrance to sickness and disease into your body, it gives the devil an opportunity against you. You remember the, 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 the guy that Christ told that uh, you should go and sin no more. Actually, there's a, 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 an interesting one in Mark chapter 2. When Christ is, tell, told the guy that your sin is forgiven, and people were wondering. So he asked that, which one is easy? Should I say the sin is forgiven or, or rise up and walk? Now, the reason why I said that, you see, sickness and disease came into the world, the, the ticket of coming into the world, everything bad, the ticket that they, they, they are entrance to the world was through sin. So Paul is saying, when you keep on sinning, what you are doing is that you are giving all these things to come into your body and into your mind. 
So, sin should be abhorrable to you for those reasons. So, grace actually preaches against sin, but it does it with the love of God. It gives you, it presents to you a better alternative to life. It shows you that, look, Christ has died for you, you are a new man, you should live according to that man. It shows you that sin will harden your heart against God. You will not be able to move with it because you don't, you won't love God because sin is having your heart. Thirdly, it says because you, you, you know you are like Christ, you, 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 but you are not sinning, and but you have the hope that when you see the two of you will look alike, you purify yourself. Because as he is, so are we in this world. For I've shown you in um, uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 11, that actually grace teaches holiness and makes you it's using because you know, you've come to know the love of God. Then five, I say, sin makes you vulnerable to the attack of the devil. It opens you up, Romans 6, 16. So that takes us to the next question. Does God... Uh, 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 is grace encouraging laziness? If we say you, you cannot um, do it by your own effort, if we say your, your effort does not count with God, does it mean that God encourages laziness? I think uh, you have to be a lazy person to assume this. It is obvious. But let me, let me quickly show you um, some things. When you go through the Bible, you will find out that everyone that God has ever used, that has ever been meaningful, were busy doing something. They were busy doing something. God does not use lazy people. And that's what I tell ministers. God does not busy. He does, he does not use lazy people. Take Abraham. When God called Abraham, Abraham took up his own household because he was a, this man was a doer, he was a provider. Take our friend David. David was taking care of his father's flock when they came to their house to anoint him. Gideon, although he was hiding, he was threshing um, wheat to feed his people in the face of adversity. Elisha, when Elijah met him, the man was uh, plowing with 12 um, oxen. So God does not have time for lazy people. Paul was busy persecuting Christians. So God, you, you must be, you, you, God, when you read the Bible, you see that God, there's no way he encourages lazy, laziness. Proverbs 22, 29 says that see as a man that is diligent in his business. He will stand before um, he will stand before kings and not mean men. John chapter 9, verse 4, Christ said, I must walk the work of him that has sent me and finish it while it's still day. So God does not have time for lazy people. So you must, that's what the, the, the first thing you want, you must know. All the disciples of Christ, when Christ called them, they were busy doing something. So, grace does not encourage people to do uh, this. Actually, grace does the, the opposite, and I, will, and I will show you. What people confuse is that, you see, there's something called the works of law and the works of faith. Self-effort is called the works of law. You are doing it, um, hoping to justify yourself. Huh? Just like the man in Luke 12 who said, Oh, um, my grand has yielded a lot of things. I'll build down the barn and do all this. I'll do that. Not giving thanks to God. He, he, he thought it was his effort that got him those things. He was the one that controlled the weather. When he put the seed in the ground, was he the one that brought the seed to germinate? So, self effort does not stand before God. 
But at the same time, God does not encourage laziness because if you believe God that he has made his provision and you enter it by faith, you will do what God asks you to do. James has a very good discourse on this. Let's look at this, James chapter 2. Let's look at James chapter 2. And I'll take it from verse um, 17. I'll take it from verse 17 to the end. So you can see this. Even so, if it is, if I have not, if it have not faith, it's dead, being alone. No, let's start from verse um, 16. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them, them not those things which they are needful of for their body. What does it profit? Verse 17. Even so, if even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. We enter the grace by faith. But a saving faith is never alone. Faith is an active, um, um, uh, active component. Verse um, 18. Ye man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. The devils also believe and tremble. Verse 20. But will thou, O man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Twice. Look, when God called Isaac and my, uh, Abraham and God said, Leave your father's house, it was because he had faith in God eh, that he left his father's house. He didn't tell God, oh, I have faith in you, and stayed in his father's house. Because he believed God, he had faith in God, that led to an action. When God asked him to sacrifice his son, because he had faith in God, knowing that God, if you go and read Hebrews 11, that God was able to raise him from the dead, he went ahead wanting to do it. If you say you have faith, it must make you do something. If I enter into a room and I shout, there's fire, there's fire, there's fire. You cannot say you believe me and sit down. It's either you shout and say, yay, or you, you, or you run out. But if you believe, there will be a corresponding action. But your action is motivated by your faith. You, your, your, your action is not the main thing. It's your faith that motivates your action. So, works of the law, uh, you are doing it uh, like a bargain with God. But work of it, you are doing it because you know God has done it. For instance, if God says, give and it shall be given unto you. The reason why you give is because you, God has said it will be given back unto you. So if you say, "Oh, I believe, oh, uh, I believe God, I, I, I believe it's true that it will give you back unto me," but you don't give, that is faith without works. It is dead. And Paul says it's like the body, and like David says, it's like the body without spirit. It's dead. So that's the difference. But let me show you one man that puts it in a, a very succinct way, uh, and it's um, our friend Paul. You know, Paul understood grace more than all his contemporaries. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 15. Paul says, from verse 15, Uh, 
from verse, sorry, from verse 9. First Corinthians 3, verse 9, says, For I am the least of the apostles that I'm not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. We know all that about uh, Paul when he was so. Verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Paul said, listen, and what I am by the grace of God is not by my doing, but knowing that the, this grace has been so imputed into me, I, I have this great fear of God, I labor more than any other person. So grace should make you more productive because you know that there's so much in store for you. God has put so much ability in you. So it should be like a driving machine. Um, Romans chapter 8, I think verse 12 says, uh, Romans chapter 12 uh, says that not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Praise the Lord. You see, I've answered those three nagging questions, those questions that will arise if you are, if if you probably understand grace. Now you should know that grace, uh, the, the, the law, came for a reason. And because it came for a reason, and the reason why it doesn't apply to us now, you should know that it's, it, it, it's the reason why it's gone with this explanation. So you should not be a law, um, a, 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 law a law keeper. In fact, if you are trying to be a law keeper, you are actually a law maker. Then two, you must know now that grace does not encourage sin. And lastly, you must know that grace should make you more productive because there's something called work of faith. Paul said, the grace of God has made me labor more than any other person. I am who I am through the grace of God, but on top of that, I labor more than any other person. Praise the Lord. What you have done today is answer the nagging questions. There's one last question that uh, probably will we'll, 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 uh, attend to some other time. Now, if we said all this, that God lost us unconditionally, that Christ died once and for all, um, is it like the evangelical says that uh, when you sin, uh, you fall again, and each time you sin, you fall? Or like the Pentecostal say, uh, once um, sin, forever sin. That's another question that people like answer. I just want to tell you that both, both are extremes and they are not right. Uh, by the grace of God, we'll have the opportunity to treat that extensively during another session of ignition. Because it, it needs proper explanation, we cannot watch it here. But I believe that the foundation we need today will help you. Uh, again, if you send me a private um, message through my Twitter handle, FBI MindGen, I'll be glad to send you uh, this compilation of my weekly blog. Uh, we call it uh, God's Spill. We say it's smooth and small enough to swallow, easily digestible to release its goodness, strictly no side effects. My name is Femi Duwu. I'm from Strong Nation, where we raise thinking Christians. Thank you for joining me. God bless you.